Hello and welcome to Linux Lads. This is episode 125. Today I'm joined by Just Connor. Hello, Just Connor. I also forgot to say that my name is Shane. <laughs> <laughs> and this week we have a special guest. Uh, we have Artyom Zorin of Zorin OS fame. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, second time you've been on the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, third time. Oh, oh Connor's third. gesturing yeah. three at me. <laughs> So I, uh, I believe so, uh, unless, unless my memory escapes me. <laughs> Just in case people don't know, uh, Zorn OS is a uh, an Irish-based distro, so uh, you guys run it from Dublin City, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, always have been. So that's great, and it, we're celebrating 15 years, I believe, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So 15 years since the release of Zorn OS 1.0, obviously development work has been happening for a little bit longer than that, but that's been like the first time people have really known about us. Yeah, that's great. Congratulations on the on the anniversary. And uh, I'm just going to launch straight into some of the questions. Connor, I'll let you go first because you came up with most of these questions. <laughs> no, no problem at all. Um, as Shane alluded to, you have been on the podcast before, but it's been a hot minute. So apologies if, um, if these questions are a repeat of some of the questions we've asked you on before. But I suppose it's, it's always good to get a, a fresh take on, on some of these questions. So 15 years, um, tell us about your initial motivation for starting Zorn OS or tell us a bit about the origins of it. Yeah, so we have to go way back. So we started back when I was 12 and my brother was 14. Originally, we were doing it as a project for the young scientists because we had just discovered Linux, first tried Ubuntu on our computer and thought it was really amazing. Like back then we were still Windows users at large and we were trying to find ways of like how to customize our system, you know, make it look cool and fancy effects and everything. And we came across some videos of Compiz, um, which for any uh, veterans out here, you'd know about of the fancy effects that it brought to the Linux. The, the, wob- the wobbly windows and the fact yeah. that, you know, wh- the, the flame when you, cr- when you close the window and yeah. <laughs> yeah, it could be a bit over the top OTT at times, but uh, we were children, so we thought it's cool. Uh, it, there, there was the cube as well. I mean, uh, wasn't it the KD recently came out with they're saying, oh, we brought back the cube. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be quite honest, we did a similar thing with Zorn OS 17. Uh, with 16, we also reintroduced the wobbly windows. Uh, <laughs> but I guess we could get on to the more recent developments a little later. Mm-hmm. I guess yeah. going back to the the early start of, of Zorn OS, it was, um, we first tried it on our computer, mainly just for all those fancy customization effects and fun little useless things that we just saw on the internet that Linux had and Windows didn't. But really, when we actually started using it properly, the penny really dropped that it wasn't just, you know, a pretty face. It was also, you know, so many other advantages, like our computer ran way faster. Uh, we also didn't really have to worry about viruses as much anymore. The privacy aspect was also a really huge deal, even more so now than it was back then. Uh, and we just kind of thought to ourselves, like, this is so much better than like Windows and Mac OS. Why aren't more people using it? Mm. We first showed it to our dad, who wasn't like a super technical computer user. He was a translator. So um, he would mainly use like the web browser, or Microsoft Office, those kinds of things, uh, like a normal computer user would. Even with Ubuntu, which was generally considered the most user-friendly distro at the time. He ran into some issues, even just from the very beginning. The fact that the interface was so different to what he used before, the fact that Mm. he couldn't use his muscle memory um, as he did with Windows, like that was kind of a big roadblock to to him. And we kind of thought that maybe that would be one of the major roadblocks that's stopping, you know, the general public from being able to use Linux on a large scale. So we thought to ourselves, Let's try and make a Linux distro that is centered around people who are just normal computer users and designed in a way that they don't have to learn anything new to get started while still all being able to take advantage of the advantages that Linux has um, that I mentioned just there. So it was a, it was a long journey after that. Uh, we actually didn't know how to program back then, uh, so we had to learn along the way. And just like with every new release, we found ways to make it even more unique and more user-friendly, developing our own apps, um, extending the desktop, 
and just building a cohesive user experience that is really tailored around just the general public. Yeah, needless to say, you're you're preaching to the converted when you're talking about the benefits of Linux. Of course. <laughs> I mean, it it's never going to be an en masse adaptation of Linux as an alternative. Unfortunately, I don't f- see that way. But hopefully, uh, at least some people, given the fact that you're in this closed ecosystem, you're you're on you're under such uh, influence and such control from such a large entity such as Microsoft. So whatever they say, you kind of have to put up with. And just re- like reaching out to people saying there is an alternative. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, if if you're familiar with the Windows paradigm of a start menu and like your taskbar at the bottom, something like Zorn OS is such a viable alternative. Speaking of uh, just something Connor touched on there, uh, like a big company essentially dictating terms to you, um, that brings us kind of neatly onto our next question, Artyom. Um, the funding model for Zorn OS, like how does that work for you, for you guys? Do do you work on it full time? Is it is it sustainable into the future? Like, there's a lot of talk about this in the Linux podcast world lately. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So from the very early stages of the project, we knew that. If this is going to be a long-term thing that we're really serious about, we know that we have to, you know, be able to put food on the table so that we can actually focus on uh, the project full time. And it's taken us a number of years to get to the level where we could do it as a full time job. And around like six, seven years ago, we were able to fully convert to that. So, and that's entirely thanks to our community those who supported us by buying our Pro Edition, which is quite an unusual thing in the Linux space. And I am aware that, you know, uh, having paid for versions of like an open source product in some cases can be a bit of a taboo, but it's something that we've been very decisive about. Like we understand that, you know, a lot of users, they do have the the expectation and only the means to be able to use a free operating system, free software, free as in free beer, not freedom, um, but also freedom, of course. <laughs> and we do want to make sure that, you know, Zornos is accessible to everyone. So we always will have a free edition that's comparable to, you know, other Linux distros like uh, Ubuntu or Mint or Fedora in features. But if we wanted to make it so that the development of a desktop operating system that's based on Linux is sustainable. We knew that we had to be able to generate revenue and maybe even expand the team in, over the long term. And the only way that we could do that without, you know, sticking in advertisements or siphoning off data, doing ulterior things like that, we wanted to provide the option of having, you know, a paid for version with extra features and extra software uh, for power users uh, and just individuals who are you know really passionate about what we're doing and want to contribute and get something back in return and um, early on in the the development of Zorn OS like we did have only just the free edition of Zorn OS and just like a donation button but when we tried out you know having the the paid for version back then it was called the ultimate edition now it's pro we found that not only did we, um, you know, get more revenue that we'd be able to, you know, invest in having faster servers to download off of, uh, but people who purchased that paid for version were really happy that, um, you know, they had that extra functionality and that they were supporting the, the project. I guess it's more of like a, a little extra benefit to, to supporting the project in, the, in this way. I I suppose it's an extra motivation for yourselves to realize yes there are people out there that that support our work that want us to continue doing what we're doing it's kind of a vote of confidence in a way mm-hmm. I'd imagine you would probably get approached by corporate people corporate contracts or or things like that so um without getting too much into too much detail if you want to give rough portions or rough figures or anything like that how much of your funding is supported by the pro or donation model versus any corporate contracts that you may take or is is there a large swing to one so the vast majority of revenue that we get is actually just from individual users mostly through the pro edition 
but also uh, a small amount in donations. We actually don't currently have any like official um, contracts with businesses or governments, but that's actually something that we want to do with our upcoming product, uh, Zoran Grid. So um, I guess to make it more uh, you know, easy to understand, I'll just go back to the beginning of that specific story, which was, I think it was back in 2016, there was a city in Italy, uh, Vicenza, it's just a couple of kilometers west of Venice. Um, they actually emailed us saying, you know, in two weeks time, we're going to switch over all of our municipal computers to Zornos. And like, we were kind of shocked because <laughs> nothing like this ever happened before. Um, it just came out of the blue and we were kind of panicking, thinking, oh, this is going to be, you know, they're going to have a lot of support requests. They're going to run into a bunch of issues. What are we going to do? Uh, funnily enough, like they just sent us a couple of, you know, basic enough technical questions on, on Facebook Messenger, very official. Uh, <laughs> and away they went. They just did a, a, a deployment right after that. They got the local Linux user group to, to help with, you know, actually the logistical challenge of installing all of the uh, Zornos on all of their computers. But they were actually quite happy with the switch over afterwards. Now, the main criticism that they had was that once they installed Zornos on all the computers, if they wanted to make some sort of a change, like installing an app or changing some settings, they'd have to send someone over to each of the computers to make that change, which is not very efficient. So that gave us the idea of making a new sort of plug-in tool to Zorn OS that would allow, you know, businesses and organizations of any size to centrally administrate all of the computers running Zorn OS. So they will just install, you know, even just our standard free edition, which is in many cases sufficient for those kinds of organizations. They would install it on all of their computers and then it works as like a client server model. So uh, a software as a service tool, essentially, that would connect to all of those computers enrolled in the organization. And then the IT admin team could just log into that web-based console and issue those commands, you know, installing apps, changing settings, things like that. Uh, basically giving full control over all of their computers in their fleets um, without having to go to each uh, system physically. So that's the next thing that we're developing that will make it possible for businesses and organizations to actually use ZornOS across their organization on a large scale. And that's sort of one of the main things that we're hoping will allow us to not only just continue the development and, and fund the development, but make the ZornOS desktop even better so that we could hire new developers and uh, you know expand the resources that we can contribute back upstream to the Linux community as well. So it's something we're excited about. That that ties in neatly into um I mean the fact that a, a, a city or a municipality in Italy uh, reached out to you like that uh, just feel, reminds me of the sad case that we have here in Ireland. I mean, uh, given the the public money public code initiative from the FSF Europe, it's a shame that all of the states uh, state or semi state uh, organizations in Ireland are pretty much just all Windows, Azure, Office 365. It's that's kind of they're locked into the the claw of Microsoft there. So it could be would be good to see um a lot of our public uh, bodies given that they're publicly funded from our from our tax money that they'll be using more open source code and mo more open source projects, but uh, unfortunately that is not the case. Yeah, I mean it's an interesting area because like there are some, you know, governments as well that are more conservative that might not want to rock the boat. Maybe they have some, you know, vested interest with those companies, like say, for example, Microsoft having their European headquarters here. There's also the case of Munich a few years back where they were running Linux on their municipal computers and it seemed like it was a successful project. They've been doing it for quite a while. And then uh, Microsoft approached the, the local government saying that, you know, we're thinking of moving our uh, German headquarters here, but under the condition that maybe you'd have to switch back to Windows. Or at least that's what it seems based on what I've, I've heard. Uh, and then unfortunately they made the switch back to Windows. Um, so there are those sort of political concerns, but at the same time, we're hearing a lot of interested 
organizations and governments who they want to see alternatives and reasonable options aside from you know the big american tech companies and they're in many cases frustrated with the data privacy concerns where very sensitive data could be sent to microsoft sent to the us outside of the eu jurisdiction which may or may not be against the gdp or law if, if you want to be very technical and legislative about these things and they want to see alternatives that you know won't hinder their productivity they won't have to spend a lot of resources developing anything themselves in the same case that munich did when they were originally starting off with their linux project many many years ago uh, that if there's a local european alternative to windows and mac os that they might be more open to considering that so that's that's an interesting trend but also even just um businesses and non-government organizations they see a lot of issues with using windows like having to buy new computers every few years uh since they're getting obsolete uh, mm -hmm. you know whenever windows loses support for a version they want to you know be able to continue using the hardware that they invested their hard-earned money on and not have to you know divert resources away from important organizational goals that they could be trying to achieve with them so it's just we want to provide like a really simple and effective alternative to windows and mac os that is ready for these organizations to use and in the long term i think that would expand the you know scope of how many people are using linux in general maybe those employees running linux or Zorn OS in their organizations, they might see that, hey, I'm actually, you know, using this computer and it's running a lot better than the Windows that I have at home. Maybe I'll install some Linux distro now that I can see that it's ready for prime time. So that's sort of our longer term goal with this. Or um, just exposure to open source projects in general. I go, yeah. oh, on my work computer, I have, I'm running this thing called LibreOffice. Oh, that, that seems to be perfectly fine. Um, oh, oh um, I have a Windows computer at home. Oh, LibreOffice is available for that too. I might download that or, or something like that. Um, yeah, it's uh, just the, the whole hardware support uh, really ring, rings home for me because, um, of just personally, like my, my father purchased a, Lenovo idea pad only a couple of years ago and he's getting the messages going oh 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 well, Windows 11 is not supported on this computer and he's rightfully so he's like I only bought this computer only a couple of years ago like there, there's nothing wrong with it and again there's nothing wrong with it it's happy out work, uh, running Windows 10 and does everything that it needs to do but he's been told he hasn't been uh, he's not able to upgrade to uh, Windows 11 I don't know it's probably the the TPM chip or something like that in the, mm -hmm. on the motherboard, or it, that's the major thing uh, in relation to Windows 11. But uh, it's just a shame that a relatively new computer cannot be upgraded the way he would like it to be upgraded. It might uh, obviously it's an opportunity for me to probably put Linux on the sly on his computer. <laughs> <laughs> very but, good, very good. <laughs> just put Zorin on it and enable the the Windows like desktop layout. <laughs> there exactly. you go. He may not even notice. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I did something similar for one of my parents a few years ago. She had uh, like some really terrible uh, display model laptop that she got on a sale. And uh, the fan would just go like 100% all the time when it was running Windows. So uh, and it was very slow, very crap. And then I put uh, Linux Mint on it and she really didn't notice any difference because <laughs> she'd literally just click the start menu or the, the cinnamon equivalent of the start menu and then launch a web browser and that's pretty much all she did on the computer anyway so it really didn't matter that much yeah yeah and that's like a perfect success story i mean there are a lot of um people maybe they're technical but they might not have that much exposure to linux and they're still uh under the impression that you know linux is you know only really for engineers by engineers that you have to tinker a lot or recompile a kernel just to get it to work on a normal computer and like we're far, far away from those days. And just to be able to show, you know, people that Linux really is ready for the vast majority of use cases, I think it's a really important thing. Like, that's a perfect story of that. Yeah, short, short of running something specialized like the Adobe Suite or something like that, it's like 90% of people's use cases can be done on Linux. 
any time that um, we, I don't exactly advertise the fact, but any time there's uh, kind of people here through the grapevine and work, I'm interested in Linux or whatever like that. They just immediately the the person like, oh, so Connor is like a developer. He's like a CLI whiz. Um, that is still to this day the everyone's first thought when they're they're not exposed to the Linux community. I'm going, no, I'm running it as my, as my daily desktop, uh, like on this computer. I do everything that I want. I do my gaming. I I watch Netflix if I want. Every, like it's my daily computer. You would actually be so surprised how many people still think this. Like yeah, I've I've heard this a couple of times and only just the last few weeks. And some people who still have this idea that Linux and open source apps that you find on Linux are all they're all like by the same group of people. Like they <laughs> seem to think it's the same. They just can't get it out of their head that it's a completely different model of developing software. And they 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 think it's like oh there's a Linux company somewhere and it <laughs> it's just not true. Like yeah, I had one guy complaining about GIMP and Inkscape and stuff as an alternative to Photoshop and Illustrator, and he was like oh why don't they just make it better and all because <laughs> it's mostly developed by volunteers. Like so yeah, it's it's an uphill battle sometimes. So looking back, can you think of any challenges that you had to overcome, like technical or otherwise, throughout however many years of, of working on Zorin OS? Where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say maybe just from the very beginning, like we set ourselves the challenge of, you know, making this Linux distro where we actually didn't know how to develop software. We've never done it before. We had no experience in it. So it was a it was a long and gradual process, even just like searching up on Google, how do I program in Python or just buying Python for dummies? That's just like one of our first steps. And on top of like just being able to learn how to, to do everything, how to program, um, I guess like back in those days, the documentation about like the different APIs that Linux had wasn't as mature as it is now. And in some cases, we'd had to, you know, go through the source code, kind of reverse engineer, maybe some of the technical stacks like the desktop environment uh, to figure out how to do what other similar apps are doing uh, so that we can implement similar functionality uh, and maybe even improve upon it. That's been a really, it was a long and difficult experience, but it was also very rewarding because we actually had something at the end of the day that people are out there using and taking advantage of and really liking it. So like there've been a bunch of other technical challenges along the way. The most recent was actually, we came out with the new upgrade feature, which was something that people have been, you know, requesting since the very beginning. So it's taken us like 14, 15 years to implement it and by the end of the project, we knew for good reason. In this case, like we had to figure out how to make it work as seamlessly as possible. So we have a number of package managers like apt, flatpak, uh, in Zorn OS, and we needed to make it so that, you know, a user can just click the upgrade to the ne- newest version of Zorn OS button and it will just take them there without too many, you know, uh, issues along the way. And, Being able to hide that complexity and make it look really simple is way more complicated than it seems on the surface. Like we ran into a bunch of issues with how do we get apt to do uh, all of those functions exactly as we needed them to do. So like upgrade in certain scenarios where you might have broken packages, for example, different repositories enabled that might interfere with some of the system packages and like kind of like renovating a house the more you get into it the bigger the problems get and sometimes there are some apis that uh didn't do what they were supposed to do and we'd have to like patch apt or some of the um libraries around apt to to fix those issues and it took a lot longer than we expected but at the end of the day it was one of the most probably yeah the most requested feature and like a really important thing uh, an addition to the entire user experience. So we're really happy that we got to the end of that process, but it was a slog. It was a true slog. You would think, uh, hypothetically, the fact that you're based on Ubuntu LTS, the fact that Ubuntu uh, has a facility to go from one LTS to the next LTS, would that help you in any way? So there's a lot of like idiosyncrasies about Zornos that make it very different from Ubuntu. And it was very helpful looking at, say, the source code behind the upgrade functionality in Ubuntu. But at the same time, like, 
it's kind of tied down to, you know, like, say, for example, some of Ubuntu's servers, not, not necessarily like their apt repository servers, but like some uh, servers that include the instructions on how to upgrade from one version of Ubuntu to another. And that those instructions are very different when it comes to Zorn OS upgrades. So we had to implement, you know, our own way of doing that. As well as that, like, when you're upgrading between Ubuntu versions, it's usually within the same edition. So if you're, you know, in Xubuntu, it upgrades just directly to the next Xubuntu or Lubuntu or just standard Ubuntu. Whereas in our case, we have like the different editions, like the core edition, education, pro edition, where, you know, it might require access to the, what we call our delivery server that has like the purchase records of what email addresses are associated with you know, what purchases of Zorn West Pro, as well as like their support code, sort of the registration number to, to allow them to upgrade to the, to the next version of Zorn West Pro, or even within the same major version of Zorn West, like in Zorn West 17. If someone's going from the core edition and they want to upgrade to the pro edition without having to reinstall the system, that's also another consideration. Uh, that's another thing that the upgrader has to do. And, that kind of functionality you don't really see in other Linux distros uh, very often. Uh, you, you raise a good point. You hadn't considered um, those scenarios, those use cases, or the fact that Ubuntu is obviously backed by a large commercial entity, um, Canonical, so they, they, they don't have to worry about the, the revenue model being built into the operating system as you do. You have to worry about, okay, this is a, a pro user and this pro user would like to be upgraded and uh, and so on. And mm-hmm. It's a lot more tailored towards your the individual people rather than other Linux distributions. Yeah, that's a very good point. Just curious, um, in terms of like upstream patches and bug fixes and stuff, do you do you do much of that? Like, do you do send much stuff upstream or? Yeah, every every now and again, if we encounter some sort of issue with, you know, some upstream software, maybe there's a bug in it. Uh, we do like endeavor to to reach out to them and and supply some upstream patches. At the same time, like a lot of the work that we do, uh in Zorn OS is mainly around the desktop experience, which differs quite a lot from other Linux distros and other upstream projects like GNOME or XFCE. So we make our source code available, but it might not fit in neatly with what the their vision is in like the upstream developers vision of their project. It's a mix of, you know, features and, and uh, apps that we develop that are unique to Zorn OS and don't really fit into other Linux distros. Uh, but also we do um, contribute upstream both code and sometimes donations to, to projects that we think really deserve it and might not get enough uh, recognition that are really important to Zorn OS, but also important to the entire uh, Linux community. Maybe you should do um, like a pop OS and just uh, like say, fuck everything and just build it all again in Rust. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually between Zorn OS 6 and Zorn OS 12, we actually had our own desktop environment, which uh, I don't think a lot of people know. Back between those, within that era, it was the time when, you know, uh, the GNOME project was transitioning from GNOME 2 to GNOME 3, and a lot of the mm. functionality that, you know, would be very much required in uh, Zorn OS desktop experience uh, just wasn't available so the only option that we really had was to to do something that you know took advantage of some of the, the new features that they implemented but in our own way so we used the GNOME 3 technical, technical stack so like say for example the Nautilus file browser, GTK uh, but when it came to the actual desktop shell uh, we use some other components, um, like a, a separate dock slash panel that you wouldn't really find in, you know, GNOME or any other desktop environments. Uh, but in the long term, we saw that, you know, GNOME Shell was maturing quite a lot. Extensions were now a thing. They weren't at exactly the stage that we wanted that would have been ready for a Zornos experience at the time that we decided to switch back to GNOME. But, uh, it's something that we could build upon. And we saw that if we were to continue developing our own desktop environment as we were in the past, 
just being able to keep up with the new fun- functionality, both hardware, new hardware that was on, on newer computers at the time, but also software features that users were now expecting. It would be way too much work kind of reinventing the wheel. Do you ever collaborate with any of the other distros that are based off Ubuntu LTS, so Linux Mint or Elementary OS or Pop OS? Is there any relationship you have with them? Do you ever reach out to them on, on a bug fix or anything like that? Yeah, I, I, I guess it's like there are a lot of projects that, you know, benefit from each other's work, which is really one of the strengths of the Linux ecosystem and, and open source development. And like uh, we see, you know, some projects using some of our code. We might include some code from other projects, not necessarily on a very like uh, with a very formal collaborative sort of mm. relationship, but just, you know, the code is there. And you can use it and you can improve upon it and submit the patches. I think we've officially run out of questions. That was uh, that was really informative. Thank you, Artyom, for, for coming along. Very much so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Before we wrap things up, we always uh, like to give our guests kind of, you know, the opportunity to plug some things that are coming up or anything you want to say, basically. Looking back at the, the past 15 years, we've been really fortunate in that. Um, you know, the people who've used Zorn OS or even just recommended it to a friend if they weren't using it themselves have been just so, so helpful and kind uh, to us. But also, yeah, we, we, we basically, I just wanted to thank everyone throughout all those years who, who've, you know, mentioned or uh, mentioned us or spread the word in any way. Yes, you can go to Zorin.com if you want to find out more about the, the distro and download it. And uh, yeah, it's great to see uh, a project like this continue for so so long and, and be successful. And it's a nice little added bonus that it's I, uh, an Irish company as well. So <laughs> we always uh, like to keep it on brand. Uh, and a, a personal anecdote was, I think it was a, a couple of episodes ago, remember, it was the Irish Times article, remember, they were talking about the fact that I did an install fest in Dublin. Mm-hmm. And when I was talking to the Irish Times journalist, I was explaining everything, like we had demonstration computers running Ubuntu, like um, Fedora, there was one running Mint, there was one running Zorn OS, and like, oh yeah. And she brought along her Microsoft Surface with an idea that she's going to be install uh, Linux there. I was explaining everything and she goes, oh, I'll pick Zorn because it's the, the Irish one. So, <laughs> so it ended up getting Zorn OS installed on her Microsoft Surface and I think she gave a plug on that on, on the Irish Times article to Zorn OS because of that. Yeah, that was Connor's little 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he got in the papers. So thank you so much for coming along, Artyom. This was really illuminating. Uh, always super interesting to get the you know, behind the scenes of, of these projects and, and find out how they work and stuff. So thank you so much. And uh, we can only recommend Zoran. I used it myself in the past. Incredibly solid distro, very well-made product. Mm-hmm. Uh, as for our socials, uh, you can go to linuxlads.com forward slash contact. And on our homepage, all our individual Mastodon handles are all linked there. So I won't go through it all. We're mainly active in our Telegram group, which is linuxlads.com forward slash telegram. You can get us on show at linuxlads.com by email. That's basically it. The rest are all on the contact page. So thank you so much for joining us again. And uh, we will see you in approximately two weeks. Bye-bye.